the topic I proposed for this talk. So you might notice something about that. Um, most significantly that uh, that was the title of Karen Coyle's keynote. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're kind of similar. So I, I gave some thought to just giving her a presentation. I thought that would be kind of funny, pretending to be her, and it probably would be better than mine. You can tell from her title that it is better than mine. At that point, she knows more about this stuff than I do. I didn't know she'd be keynoting on it when I proposed it. So as I said, I'd try to keep this short. I can just kind of say, so yeah, what, what Karen said, and then I can say thank you. Any questions? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> But no, at the end of Karen's proposal, she did suggest that I talk a little bit about the technical implications of some of this stuff and what some of this work means to people in this community. So I tried to rewrite some of what I was doing after I had spoken to her. Um, and what I've come up with instead is, so what Talis is up to, what Rob said. And I could just leave it at that this time. <laughs> But no, 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 no. I, as in all seriousness, I thought I would do some kind of a proof of concept. I thought I'd talk a bit about how this technology can make our lives easier, demonstrate that more rigorously modeled data improves interoperability, at the very least show something that's kind of cool, but I'm lazy. Um, and I didn't get to that. So I don't know if you can all see this, uh, the, the, my code's compiling. At one point when I was working on this, that was actually true. Actually, it was interpreting. But then I got distracted because I uh, not only am I lazy, I'm borderline uh, attention deficit disorder. So <laughs> what ended up happening is I decided I'd just do some hand waving and talk to you a little bit about what the DCMI and RDA are trying to do together, build a little bit on what Karen said yesterday morning, and talk a little bit about why this stuff seems really significant to me and what I think some of the problems with it are. So the significance to me is we're all doing this metadata normalization stuff. We're, I'm in the process of normalizing data into primo normalized XML for ingest into Xlibris' primo system. More mic? There we go. Thanks, Dan. Um, people are doing it for Indeca. People are doing it for Aqua Browser. People are constantly pulling together different sources of information. And it's a pain. It, we, we do the same thing over and over and over again. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm kind of getting tired of constantly renormalizing mark data and talking to uh, people about local idiosyncrasies in our mark data and what differences things make. Um, did I jump already to that application profile stuff? So <laughs> this slide was in Karen's presentation. I really think the DCMI folks are on to something with this new notion of the Singapore framework, which emerged out of the 2007 Dublin Core con con Conference. The, as Karen was saying the other day, all we have at this point is the usage guidelines, the very top layer of this. Everything that it's supposed to be built on doesn't really exist in the library community. The closest things we have to a domain model are Ferber and then the random implicit kind of tacit metadata model that is in Mark. And we don't like that, right? It, it gets really, really, really frustrating. So Dublin Core proposes that building on RDF concepts and RDF description logics, you can create domain models and that's what DCMI is purported to do with the abstract model. Develop syntax and encoding guidelines. Develop then specific application level profiles, which they describe as making up, being made up of description set profiles, more for specific syntax guidelines, encoding guidelines, and then finally these usage guidelines. So what does all of that mean, right? That's a big, just messy, messy pile of boxes with arrows pointing between them. Um, in the context of Dublin Core, the significant things here are the abstract model, DCAM, which kind of builds on the RDF semantics document in an attempt to model what Dublin Core thinks of metadata as being. And I can talk a little bit about a lot of some people in this room either, I, even. I know Jonathan Rokind and Peter Murray were talking with Stu Weibel and Andy Powell in some blog conversations as recently as two weeks ago about why we even need DCAM and what purpose it serves. And those are really good conversations to be having. And I'll get back around to that at the very tail end of the presentation. But um, 
The other things that come into this, so DCMI is redoing the way their terms are broken down. They've split out the 15, what they're now calling legacy elements, and everything else they're putting into this terms namespace. And they're defining classes. They're starting to define the entities that are being described by various properties and vocabulary elements, which is kind of important because it's something we don't do a good job of here in library land, right? We've got things like publishers that we define with a string that includes their location, their name as it's transcribed on the title page, as Karen said the other day, and the date of publication for some strange reason. That's what's in that publisher mark field. Those are three separate things, and none of them, well, one of them is technically about the book itself, or the material itself. So how do you separate out what those various classes of things being described are is fairly important, and it's what I think a lot of these folks are getting at when they talk about rigorous data modeling standards. Then application profiles and description set profiles enable you to take the definitions that are being built by one community, and if they're defined in a standardized way, you can kind of merge them together with definitions being described in other communities. And you can build what Mikhail Nielsen's now talking about as metadata harmonization as opposed to normalization. And this paper is really interesting. It just came out literally last month. Um, and it got me thinking, and it got me thinking about a distinction between what I was talking about before and what he's talking about here. Mikhail and, and company talk about metadata harmonization as the ability to use several different metadata standards in a single software system. Got me thinking that metadata normalization, which is what we're always up to, is mapping several different metadata standards to a single schema or structure for use in a single software system. It's a subtle distinction, but I think it's an important one because that mapping is what we're constantly doing over and over again. And it's what not having a thorough understanding of what our metadata is, what it's describing, how we conceptualize it, where, where a lot of this becomes just duplication of effort and hugely problematic. So I don't know if you can see that. This is to make um, a point, I think. This is what happens when really, really smart people try to figure out how to model MARC metadata. So what I did to get this, um, Mark can be turned into mods, and mods is kind of an ugly mess too, right? The simile folks at MIT then created a really cool setup for turning mods into what they're calling mods RDF. It's an RDF representation of mods records, and they attempt to model everything that's going on in there. And they converted the entire Barton catalog, so MIT's entire book catalog is available as mods RDF. I grabbed one record out of that, I ran it through the W3C's RDF validator to generate a graph and see what it would actually look like. And this is what I got. If anyone wants to see it close up, come and find me during one of the breaks or later. It's really kind of entertaining. Everything, well, I want to point at it and yet still talk to you. Everything on the left is about the record. It's the record number in the local system, the ISBN, identification information as to what the metadata is basically. In the middle, you start getting all of the properties that are represented by various different mark elements, basically. And the reason it keeps spilling over to the right is those properties sometimes are not literals. They're not strings. They actually identify further things. This is kind of what I was getting at when I was talking about that classes stuff. They identify publishers. They identify people and corporations who are involved in creating a resource. They identify conceptual entities that really are abstractions of a topic. And then those things in turn have types, what they are, and they have their own string labels in particular languages, in particular contexts, and it just keeps going off to the right there. It's kind of um, a mess. And that's, I mean, that's a really concerted and, and well-intended and pretty accurate attempt to represent in this sort of graph model what library metadata looks like. I think that's problematic, especially since it's just the bibliographic data. It doesn't include any of the authorities' data. It, doesn't, it coins new URIs for anything that's a non-literal value. So basically, anything that represents another thing rather than just being a string, it, the MIT folks just created a URI for that. And they reused it across their entire data set, but they didn't 
coordinate with folks who were trying to do similar things. And then in addition to that, it's got some modeling errors in it. Um, nobody necessarily gets this right because our, our data is such a mess. The one that stands out to me is because we only stands out because we were trying to reuse this work in the DCMI community. In their modeling of publisher, you see they've landed this location element. And then inside of that, they've got a place element for the publisher's location. But that's not what the mods location element is. The mods location element is the equivalent of Mark Holdings data. It's the physical location or virtual location where the resource lives. And so even when you're trying to figure out how this stuff models, it's hard to keep straight what in the heck's going on with our data because, well, because it's all over the board. The mods folks have since added even more to the location element. So now you can start cramming information about the building that things are housed in and you can start clamming, cramming classification information in there. And I think the really fun one is they now allow a URI in that location element that is the website of the physical place where the material is housed. So if you've got this thing in a library collection, you can have a URI in there that really is just the library's homepage. Or you can have a URI in there that's the virtual location of an electronic representation of the resource. How do you keep track of all this stuff? Not easily. Um, where my work into this, where some of my work on this comes in is with authority data. Um, I mentioned that authorities aren't represented at all in that huge graph node that comes out of the simile stuff. Controlled vocabularies provide tremendous value to all kinds of web systems that are trying to do some of this linking open data stuff that MIT and the Semantic Web folks and the W3C and the Dublin Core and increasingly people in our library community are talking about wanting to do. So people are making efforts to start to publish these things um, in, in RDF formats. SCOS, the Simple Knowledge Organization Structure, is really good for taxonomies and classification systems. It's, um, I started some preliminary work representing LCSH in it. Uh, Ed Summers has done a tremendous amount of work on top of that at Library of Congress, and they should be actually publishing web services on that enable you to essentially do registry type stuff, similar to what John was presenting on the other day with controlled vocabularies, particularly with LCSH, where you can ask for it, a SCOS representation of a term and maybe some of the broader and narrower terms around it and get all that back. That'll work for things like Dewey, uh, Library of Congress classification, MASH headings, a variety of other things. We need a similar structure for name authorities. Um, FOF doesn't cut it because FOF, friend of a friend, is really just a way of representing social networks. And it doesn't help you with what somebody's areas of research are, where it kind of helps you with institutional affiliation. It doesn't help you with identifying things they've published, uh, different forms of their name, how their name looks in different languages, et cetera. Um, as we're doing this, what that essentially amounts to is building URIs for both concepts and agents, right? Scoss, in the, concept, in the context of all these controlled vocabularies, you're assigning URIs to an idea, a topic, an abstraction. In the context of name authority stuff, you'd be assigning URIs to things that act, things that publish, things that write, corporate bodies, um, personal entities and enabling that to be really linked out of a bibliographic record instead of just represented by a string, which is what we do now. We could arguably do the same thing for Ferber entities. Um, if they prove to pan out as how we want to model some of the data in our domain, we could be pointing to essentially an authority record for that top level work in that structure from various manifestation and expression level records. Quick example of LCSH. This is the LCSH record for the World Wide Web. That's how that would look in SCOS. All those broader or narrower terms are, right now they're just example identifiers. Ed's assigning real identifiers to them. You could then query something based on the label that you have in your bib record, get back the URI for this thing, as well as a whole bunch of other related types of information that would enable you to do, start doing some visualization of what the topic space of this is and better enable you to track and keep tabs on related resources. I'm going to shut up very soon because I'm just rambling at you, I think. Um, but 
there were two other things I wanted to say, and I'm forgetting what one of them is, because I think there's supposed to be a slide here that is not. So I'm just going to jump to the end and say that the main reason I wanted to get up here um, was to provide some overview on what Karen already talked about, but she's already done that, and so I didn't want to reiterate too much of what she said. But I also want to get people from this community involved in some of the DCMI work. Um, and Karen gave you ha information on how to get on the DCMI RDA task force list, and I think that's one important place where this group can be making some contributions. But I think another one is the architecture forum. The folks who decide what all of this data modeling for the DCMI community is going to look like. Because they're loaded down with really, really theoretical types um, who really enjoy abstract models and perhaps aren't as grounded in practical realities as people in this community. And I mean, I don't, I don't have your tech skills and I try to represent this perspective in this forum and it's not an easy thing to do. So it would be really cool if more folks from this community would at the very least jump on this listserv, pay attention to things going up on the wiki, pay attention to these notions of description set profiles, application profiles, what these things are doing and what the contribution to that for the linked open data community is. Um, trying to figure out where in this giant web of data, the beginning and end of a library catalog record is, and what kinds of things that are part of what DCMI thinks of as description sets, essentially related resource descriptions that cluster around a description of a particular thing in, in our collections. Um, contributing on that front would be really useful, and I, I think it would, the, the both I really think the Dublin Core community would benefit from it a lot. So in addition to the Architecture Forum, a last plug for DC 2008 um, is in Berlin, Germany in September, September 26th through 20, 22nd through 26th. The theme of the conference is metadata for semantic and social applications. The call for papers closes on March 30th. That's about a month away. Um, like I said, I've heard presentations here that the DCMI community would really benefit from hearing. Folks, things that you folks are, are doing right now, they need that practical, technical implementation perspective. And I would love it if more people from this community would consider contributing to what DCMI is up to. And this time, really, I, it, it is the end of my presentation. <laughs>